All right, welcome everyone to ARCI's uh, video meeting number eight. We have uh, managed to do seven of these thus far and we're on a roll. And I'd like to thank everybody who's uh, showed up today to, to be with us here and a uh, special welcome to all the other club members. Uh, we got people from all over the country uh, joining us, which is very cool. And uh, I think there were over 50 people that had uh, registered for this meeting and everybody's signing on as we speak here. So uh, these have been very successful and I'd like you all to consider being a presenter at these meetings. We have uh, lots of great club members out there with lots of information that have lots of great knowledge about their hobby and I'd like to encourage you to to join in uh, in the future here and, and be a presenter. So I'm reminding you now, our next meeting is March 20th. And uh, Matt will uh, remind you later with a poll question to see if you are interested and uh, see if you can uh, sign up and maybe be a, a presenter in the future. And also we welcome your feedback at that email address. Just let us know what you think about these things. And uh, I always wanna give a reminder that this meeting is being recorded and we're gonna put it on YouTube uh, at some later point. And Matt will talk a little bit about that in a minute. Uh, the ground rules for our presentations and the show and tells is that you have a prearranged amount of time to talk. And uh, that includes questions. And uh, if you're the presenter, you can ask everybody to hold their questions to the end or you can let them fire away as they want to. And as a uh, participant in the meeting, please stay on mute until you have a question. Uh, that way we, we cut down on the dogs barking and things like that. So that's probably the most important thing as a participant in the meeting is to know where your mute button is. So today's agenda, uh, you can see that we've got four presentations uh, and previewing uh, all of that, preceding all of that, is uh, Matt's going to talk about YouTube, which is a new thing for the club. And so with that being said, I will turn it over to Matt. Okay. So here we are, all drinking our coffee, enjoying our uh, club Zoom meeting. And... Um, We have to have a way, or we decided we wanted to have a way to accommodate people who couldn't actually make it here on Saturday mornings. So we chose YouTube uh, as a good vehicle. Why did we pick YouTube? Well, uh, the technology underpinnings are incredible. You can see high quality video from everywhere. We're not trying to limit it to just uh, club members. And most importantly, it's free, <laughs> which is great for us. So what's up there? Well, first off, the channel is the Antique Radio Club of Illinois. And we've already got all but one of our online meets posted up there. Now, it takes a huge amount of time to go from uh, recording to something that's uh, plausible for public. YouTube, I've got over 100 hours into getting the seven videos up there that we have there now. So uh, expect about a month lag from the time we have a live Zoom meeting to the time it's posted up uh, on our key. So hopefully before the following meeting, we'll have the previous meeting up there. Um, if you're interested in some tech stats, uh, so far we've got about 479 views. These are numbers from last night. 76 hours of our material has been watched, 58 subscribers, and 5,200 impressions. Impressions are when YouTube shows a, a thumbnail of one of our videos to other people based on its algorithms. Um, we will not be sending emails out when um, we're posting new stuff up on YouTube. Why? Because YouTube has this incredible mechanism already for notifying people of new content. It's called subscribe and hit the notify bell button. So if you want to be notified, subscribe. So now that we're up on YouTube, there are a couple of things that we need to pay attention to a little more than we have before. Uh, that's privacy 
uh, a kind of live on tape production and YouTube's rules. So first off, we wanted to make our material available to all. So it is actually available to all. Anybody on the internet can see it. Um, so we need to pay a little more attention to things that we show and don't show. Uh, one example is that as we're all looking at the gallery view right now, you can see people's names uh, underneath uh, in the bottom left-hand corner of those pictures, uh, the pictures, those names are not recorded. I haven't actually tested every single possibility of what is and what isn't recorded. So it's starting to go up and take a look at what's up there. Obviously video and audio is recorded. So um, kind of messy room, you don't want people to see it, uh, move the camera or do like I'm doing right now and use the virtual background. Um, if you want to be careful about your email, if you don't want it posted up on YouTube, just omit it from presentations or any material that you share. The best place to include your email and other contact details, private links, directions to your house, all that kind of stuff, that's in the chat window. The chat is not recorded. Uh, in YouTube. And also, um, as I've demoed a number of times, you can save the chat file as a viewer uh, and, and to a file on your computer. So if people do even, don't even have to uh, write those down. All the older meets uh, that we posted up on YouTube were edited. Uh, a couple of people expressed some concerns about having their names up there. Uh, as an example, um, we did a, a door prize and the door prize uh, in it, I listed all of the participants in a random number generator. And that's how we tossed the bouncing ball in order to pick the winner. So I fuzzed out all the names in the one that's up on YouTube. And last but not least, let's respect the forum. Um, this is not an opportunity or a place for a club business meeting. Uh, we're doing presentations on radios. Uh, and it's either semi-public, we've got 60 some viewers right now are totally public. So let's just keep that in mind. Um, you've probably heard this many times. Uh, this program was recorded before a live studio audience. Well, we're the live semi-studio audience right now. And in order to um, uh, select what's good for YouTube, you will hear uh, the recording being stopped and started uh, during the meet. What is not included is the uh, for sale wanted section and the open discussion and possibly other stuff as needed. And last but not least, uh, we need to follow the YouTube well intended rules. So YouTube uh, is very concerned about copyrighted material. We've already had one uh, copyright strike against us because one of our presenters had some background music going on and uh, it heard it and identified it and identified who the copyright holder was and made clear in no uncertain terms to me that I needed to omit it. Uh, so that required more and more editing. That's not so please, no background. If you've restored a radio and you're showing it, you're doing band scans, you have to do like we've all seen other YouTubers do. And if they're playing music on the station, you know, don't stay on it very long. I've heard the magic number is 16 seconds. Uh, but I really don't know. Just make it brief. Um, and then the second thing is we need to be careful about duplicate material uh, that's already on another YouTube channel. Uh, YouTube wants to make sure that people are not just simply copying other people's videos and posting it on their channel. Um, so in general, make sure that there's nothing already on another YouTube channel. There are some instances where we've had to work around that. And uh, Bob Losher is giving a presentation this afternoon, or this morning rather, um, where we've addressed that because he does have the similar content on another YouTube channel. And uh, last but not least, um, we control the vertical, we control the horizontal. Remember outer limits? Well, we are also learning as we're doing. So adjustments may be needed in the future. And given the time lags, I won't be able to tell everybody in advance that you know edits will be made or whatever uh, to comply with. So that's it. Um, do we have any questions? 
Go ahead, Ted. Um, one of the things that I notice is that the sound quality on these Zoom seems to vary where sometimes it's like someone's in a tunnel and other times it's crystal clear. Is there any way of trying to uh, peek out the, uh, the sound quality? My guess is that uh, what you're hearing are, uh, is a result of the audio devices for the individual presenter. And, um, you know, you've got the headset uh, is one, you know, if you have a high quality headset that generally sounds best. Um, I have a low quality headset, so I actually chose not to use it today. Um, the other issue is internet bandwidth. Uh, YouTube, uh, sorry, Zoom is engineered so that it prioritizes audio over video. So if there's congestion, it'll try to preserve the audio and you'll see the video pause. Um, if it's really bad, there is an option when you're connecting on Zoom to connect with telephone audio. You can even switch to phone audio uh, in the middle. And that way you can just dial it in from a better connection. Thank you. Okay, Tom, take it away. Okay, so uh, thank you, Matt, for that comprehensive review there with YouTube. That's uh, very interesting. And we all have Matt to thank for our, uh, our new YouTube channel. So check it out, it's really cool. And uh, you can go back and see all the meetings that, that we've had. Uh, so our agenda today, we have four presentations, as you can see there, items one through four on the agenda. And then after that, we will be doing show and tell time. And sometime during the course of the presentations, Matt will interject a polling question to ask you if you're gonna be doing a show and tell or you plan on doing a show and tell, just so we get an idea of how many so we can budget the time for the rest of the meeting. The same thing, he will ask you a question about if you have any items for sale that you wanna talk about or items wanted. That way we can budget our time. So you'll see some polling questions pop up uh, during the course of the four presentations. So uh, just expect that. And without any other comments, I'm gonna proceed now to uh, our first presentation by Robert Lozier. He's a member of MARC and AWAA. And he's uh, got an excellent presentation on a very unique uh, 1920s era electrodyne receiver. So I will turn it over to Robert. All right, thank you. And uh, I am uh, going to use a, a pre recorded, specially uh, developed for this meeting. And uh, to get around the fact that uh, I want to present this at uh, other uh, uh, at other venues and so now hopefully you see a full screen all right so uh, I'm gonna let her rip for almost uh, uh, 10 minutes and 48 seconds so okay here we go vintage radio item with little known facts or lore a truly unique American-made radio of 1924-25, with connections to the vibrant Chicago area radio manufacturing scene of the day. This item is trademarked as the Electrodyne. A Chicago land product worthy of being called unique. Full name, the Electrodyne Peerless Two-Tube Super Reflex Receiver. Found in the estate holdings of the late Lauren Peckham, one of the founding fathers of the Antique Wireless Association. From the factory, it is a two-tube reflex receiver with tube filaments that can be lighted by 110 volts AC 60 Hz. It has a built-in horn-type loudspeaker using a Burns driver. This particular set has a built-in V eliminator using an 01A triode as a half-wave rectifier. To date, no other equivalent radio is known to have been marketed in the USA during the 1920s. 
The Electrodyne appears in this October 1925 issue of Radio Retailing Magazine. The headline reads, Lamp Socket, Radio to Have Important Place. With the exception of the RCA Radiola 30 and the RCA Model 104 powered loudspeaker, you have probably never seen in person any of the other AC powered sets pictured in this page. I'm pretty sure that I have not, and I have been a collector since 1967. I just found this advertisement for the Electrodyne in the November 15, 1924 issue of the Talking Machine World. This is exciting in that it places the Electrodyne as being one of the very first North American broadcast receivers to be AC mains powered. Initially, it seems that the radio had an internal transformer that powered only the tube filaments on AC, and the 90 volt B voltage came from an external Fordac brand B eliminator. Apparently, the tube filament power came from the same design of transformer used in this Eagle brand charger made by the Eagle Carburetor Company, Cleveland, Ohio. More about that shortly. Everybody knows, or at least thinks they know, that the Dynergy RC250 is the first, at least American made, batteryless radio to make it to market. It is listed in the November 1924 Radio Trade Directory, but note that it is identified as being for 110 volt DC. This undated advert says that it is for both AC or DC. This ad may be from a 1925 publication. The late Alan Douglas, in his wonderful three-volume set, Radio Manufacturers of the 1920s, says that the Dynergy A, A for AC, is from the 1925 model season. Is the box below an AB eliminator to convert AC mains to DC for the radio? So maybe, just maybe, this was not the first presumed AC main set for our broadcast market. Here you see parts of the operating instruction sheet pasted on the inside surface of the lift-out plywood back cover of the cabinet. The Electrodyne set proclaims, operates from storage battery or alternating current only. What it does not say is that the alternating current can only be used for lighting the tube filaments. The connection terminal strip shows that it also requires a 4.5 volt C battery and an external 90 volt B battery. So here it is in its only lightly retouched glory. It is possibly the only surviving example. The original grill cloth is rotted and torn. Fortunately, a few fingernail sized fragments encased in hide glue around the edges of the horn positively reveal the original cloth to be chartreuse colored rayon fabric. Rayon fabric is no longer available, but silk fabric for bridal gowns is an exact match in color and weave. The original power plug is an Edison screw type plug, not a two blade plug. I installed this plug for testing and forgot to replace the original before taking pictures. Adjusting the transformer that lights the tube filaments is a set and forget type procedure. The printed instructions on the back cover do not mention the B battery eliminator circuit installed in this radio. Was this B battery eliminator in place when the radio was sold? I speculate about that in a moment. This view shows the radio power transformer used to light the tube filaments. Certainly looks very similar to the Eagle charger just shown. The transformer core has three legs. One outer leg is for a 110 volt 
60 Hz primary, and the other outer leg is for a center tap secondary winding. It has a maximum output of about 6 volts under load. That output voltage is adjusted by rotating a magnetic shunt in the center leg. This type of power regulation scheme was used in some early multi kilowatt welding transformers, but I know of no other radio using this technique. In this radio, there are two coils of resistance wire connected across the output terminals, apparently to limit the maximum voltage that can be seen by the tube filaments. Just recently, I found another of these radio power transformers in a ham fest junk box. Price just $2. Of course, I bought it. The B eliminator parts installed in this electrodyne are all found in the Timmons B eliminator patented in 1923. Their advertising claimed it to be the first commercial B eliminator on the market. First versions of this unit used a UV201A as a half wave rectifier. I have found no advertisements indicating that Timmons sold individual parts, so maybe their parts were not available at retail. This could suggest that the B supply, as built into this radio, did indeed come from the factory. Here is the schematic of the set minus the B eliminator circuit, a series tuned aerial circuit and a parallel tuned grid circuit RF transformer coupled to a fixed detector driving an audio transformer. The audio loops back through V1 to be transformer coupled to the audio output tube. The reflex detector is a carborundum brand fixed type. They are only considered sensitive if they have a DC bias current provided, which this circuit does not have. This radio does work with all the original components. The eliminator with its transformer and filter capacitors encased in a rosin potting compound run cool as a cucumber, powering just two tubes. It plays loud on a 4 kilowatt station less than 2 miles away from my house, but can just barely detect a 50 kilowatt station only 25 miles away. Here is the very nicely laid out chassis with its quality components. I note that the carborundum detector was always advertised as needing to have a slight bias of 200 to 800 millivolts for best operation. This radio contains no such provisions for biasing. This was definitely a local receiver and not very selective at all. The broadcast band was rapidly filling with stations. It must have experienced severe QRM from day one. But if you want to fill your radio collecting stable with unique sets, this is a great candidate. Another nice perspective view. The only other information I have found is this registration of the trademark, filed September 1924. The announcement seen on slide three in Talking Machine World was filed by a New York City distributor organization. Any other information would be greatly appreciated. Inquiring minds want to know who was really the first to make an AC powered light socket radio for the American public. It is highly probable that, at a minimum, this set is the first self contained AC powered set on the market. Well, thank you, Robert. That was an excellent presentation. Does anyone have any questions for for uh, Robert? What what tubes were used? Were they were the radio the radio used two hundred one A's? Yes, the answer is O uh, one A's, and uh... I guess it's moderately interesting because powering the O one A's with AC filaments, I would have thought thought would have created incredible amounts of hum. 
Well, if you notice uh, that uh, uh, the output of that little transformer is center tapped. And so that helps to uh, balance out the hum. And of course, the Burns driver in that uh, outfit uh, is not going to reproduce uh, 60 or 120 yeah. hertz hum very well anyway. Question. Um, Charles Osborne is listed on your patent uh, number. Does anybody know anything about him? Uh, right now, I, I don't have any information. Yeah. Could you run by that presentation again? I was late. <laughs> Catch it on YouTube. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, thank you, Robert. Well, you, you put a whole lot of uh, research into that one, and you certainly do have a rare and unique radio there. Um, I'm uh, preparing a bunch of these, actually. Uh, if any of you know me at the radio meets, I love to exhibit stuff. And of course, I always put a, a notebook with uh, my exhibits, but of course, very few people have time to read it. And uh, so I think I'm, the idea is to transfer what I've got information in the notebooks to uh, a series of presentations like this. If, if it proves to be worthwhile. And, uh, that's... Well, I think, uh, I think it's uh, very worthwhile to uh, share this kind of stuff with the club and we look forward to, to more of those, Robert. So keep at All it. Right. Okay, so I invite other people to give me competition. <laughs> well, that's great. Um, uh, before we go into the next presentation, uh, Matt's putting up some polls uh, in front of us there, and I think they're almost done. So as soon as that poll concludes, we'll, we'll start into Edward uh, Tasich's presentation about uh, the Marconi Cape Cod site. So... We took a family vacation to Cape Cod in July of 2012. South Wellfleet, Massachusetts on Cape Cod is the location of the Mar first Marconi site that performed a transatlantic wireless transmission from the United States to Europe. I'm gonna present some information on Marconi and some of you with an engineering background may find some of this technical information interesting about the company, the Marconi Wireless Telegraph and Signal Company two Marconi sites on Cape Cod, some Titanic trivia, and I'll close with two quick humorous non-radio related items. Uh, Marconi did not attend school as a child and did not go on to formal higher education. He learned chemistry, math, and physics from tutors. A tutor taught the 17-year-old Marconi the basics of physical phenomena, as well as new theories on electricity. Heinrich Hertz demonstrated that one could detect electricity magnetic radiation in 1888. In the early 1890s, Marconi began working on the idea of wireless telegraphy. There was a great deal of interest in radio waves in the physics community, but this interest was in the scientific phenomenon, not in its potential as a communication method. Hertz's death in 1894 brought published reviews of his earlier discoveries, including a demonstration on the transmission and detection of radio waves by a British physicist in an article about Hertz's work. This article renewed Marconi's interest in developing a wireless telegraphy system based on radio waves. In the summer of 1895, Marconi moved his experiments outdoors on his father's estate in Bologna. He tried different arrangements and shapes of antenna, but even with improvements, he was only able to transmit signals up to one half mile. Later, he then found that that much greater range could be achieved after he raised the height of his antennas and grounded his transmitter and receiver. With these improvements, the system was capable of transmitting signals up to two miles and over hills. His monopole antenna reduced the frequency of the waves compared to the dipole antenna used by Hertz and radiated radio waves that traveled longer distances. Marconi's experimental apparatus proved to be the first engineering complete commercially successful radio transmission system. Okay, slide three. 
Marconi developed the first practical transmitters and receivers between 1895 and 1901. Marconi's wireless telegraph and signal company was formed in 1897 after it was granted a British patent for wireless and dominated the early radio industry. The company opened the world's first radio factory in Chelmsford, England in 1898 and were responsible for some of the most important advances in radio and television. These first transmitters did not transmit audio like current radio stations, which I think we all know, but transmitted information by radio telegraphy, in other words, Morse code. Stations were established in Australia, four in Canada, France, three in Ireland, India, Italy, Newfoundland, Spain, South Africa, five in the UK, and six different states in the US. Marconi had two types of stations. There were coastal stations, which communicated with wireless stations on ships, providing weather and navigation information. These stations transmitted on what is now the AM band frequencies, 500, 660, and 1000 kilohertz. Transoceanic stations were large high-powered stations with huge antenna rays with output power of 100 kilowatts to one megawatt. To achieve daylight communications at such long ranges, they used frequencies in the VLF band from 50 to as low as 15 to 20 kilohertz. The Morse code was transmitted at 100 to 200 words per minute using automated paper tapes. Slide five. The South Wellfleet Station on Cape Cod was established in 1903 and was the site of the first transatlantic wireless communications between the US and Europe. Now, before I show you the next set of slides, I will caution you that over 100 years after it was built, there is very little evidence of this site still available. And in 2021, nothing at all remains of the site. In the center of the top slide, you can just make out the re probable remains of the Headquarters House Foundation. This is what was there in uh, 2012, as I said, it's the Interpretive Display Pavilion. Here's the plaque inside the display pavilion uh, commemorating the first wireless transmission. Some uh, background information on uh, Marconi at the pavilion. This is the text of the message sent from President Roosevelt to King Edward VII. And then on the right side, there's the uh, chronology of the site. Next slide. Marconi erected a large antenna array on four towers. They were built out of three inch by 12 inch pieces of wood, 210 feet high on concrete bases. 12 one inch guy wires stabilized each towers being anchored by crossed wood timbers buried eight feet in the sand. The transmitting station was powered by a 45 horsepower kerosene engine that ran a generator that produced 2,200 volts AC to a Tesla transformer, which stepped it up to 20,000 volts needed to send the signal to a similar station in the UK. The transmitter house had a 20,000 volt condenser, antenna coil, and whirling spark gap rotor, <laughs> which could be heard four miles downwind. The wire antenna was shaped like an inverted pyramid, at the top was a square, heavy-stranded copper wire. Attached to this were 200 smaller wires, which converged in midair just above the transmitter house. This is a diorama of what the uh, site looked like. These next two slides are the remains of some of the inland cross timber anchors that, uh, that, are, that were still there uh, nine years ago. The, Ones more towards the sea were uh, <laughs> have been washed into the ocean many years ago. These next two slides are the concrete mains of probable remains of two of two of the other anchors. In 
And this might be the remains of the base of the antenna array. One of the station's most notable roles occurred with the sinking of the Titanic. And uh, glad you mentioned something about um, not playing background music. I was thinking of playing the background music from Titanic, but we're not gonna worry about uh, copyright now. <laughs> Operators at the station were able to alert the RMS Carpathia so that they could rescue the Titanic's passengers. This station at Wellfleet was shut down in 1917 in part over concerns about security in World War I, but also because its towers were threatened with erosion. In 1920, usable materials and equipment were removed from the site and it was abandoned. Marconi moved the station to Chatham by 1912 and the Titanic and Carpathia communications were done from there. There is debate as to whether the Wellfleet Station was actually ever put into commercial use. This shows the uh, erosion that took place from uh, 1903 to 1980. And uh, as you can see by uh, 1980 and in 2012, uh, the outbound, the, out, the outer antenna arrays were long gone. Um, no trace of the site remains as of September 2014 Erosion to the sea has claimed all of the original sites. These next three slides are pictures of the erosion and the beach area. I'm guessing maybe it was uh, 75 to uh, 100 feet down. So it was the very, very significant erosion out on Cape Cod. And as luck would have it, Radio Fest in uh, 2012 had a display about the Titanic and the uh, Marconi uh, radio, uh, looks like, I think that's probably an antenna there on the right. Uh, I don't know if anybody's on the Zoom meeting that re remembers this or if this is your display. Is that courtesy of the Bard family? Yeah, I'll say that's uh, Bard's. Does it, does it look like, yeah, okay. I'm glad somebody could identify that. Now, I'm not sure about this, these next two pictures, but this might be the remains of the antennas when, the, when he moved it to the uh, Chatham location. Now, on the lighter side, we were at a seaside restaurant a few hundred yards away fishing boats were coming in with their catch. We overheard another customer say, and I don't know if he was trying to be funny or not, but he said, is the seafood fresh? Come on, buddy, the, sea, the fishermen just pulled in, tied up and delivered the, the fresh seafood 20 minutes ago. What do you mean, <laughs> was the seafood fresh? <laughs> and then I don't know if any of you remember this, but I'm a big uh, fan of Matt, the series MASH. Master Sergeant Woody Woodruff is in charge of the mim 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 mimeograph machine at i -Corps. He also owes BJ and Hawkeye combined poker debts totaling more than $100. He suggests that repaying his poker debt by making Corporal Radar O'Reilly a second lieutenant. When the promotion papers arrive at MASH 407th, Colonel Potter is confused and wants to call i -Corps. Radar on, is on leave, so there is nobody who knows how to use the phone. And obviously Hawkeye and BJ don't want Colonel Potter to know what's going on. So Hawkeye and BJ try to discourage Colonel Potter by making the call, claiming that only two people know how to work the phone, Radar and Sergeant Marconi. Any questions? And can anybody add anything? I'm glad somebody mentioned that that was uh, those, uh, that well, 2012, uh, go, go ahead. Was a plaque moved someplace else? Or is it totally gone? You know, I, I, man, I sure hope so. And I, I hope they they grab those, uh, you know, maybe that that uh, those bricks from the bottom of the uh, trans of the antenna, and maybe those uh, those those anchors. But I, I don't know. I, I, I I'll, I'll try to do some uh, look up something on the internet. But uh, yeah. man, I hope that just didn't all wash into the sea because that's yeah. uh, you know something historic. Once it's gone, it's it's gone. Who knows? Yeah, it would be a shame. I was on a business trip back around. I want to say it was in '84, 
doing some workout in that area with a, with a buddy of mine from Zenith. This is a Zenith trip we took. And we went out to that site. And in 84, I guess more of it was there because I remember the I remember the plaques and and some of that some of that art, some of the artifacts were still there. And somewhere I have to look at my archives. I think I have pictures. Interesting that uh, Marconi helped build the or put together the first Vatican radio. I actually <laughs> got to go inside their station on a trip. It was the day of 9/11, in fact, and uh, I managed to wangle in the door with the station engineer who had some English. He was showing me a 1930s era transmitter, I think German build that was still in use. I'll have to look, I've only got photos from outside. Wow. I didn't try and take any inside and put more pressure on the poor guy, but uh, interesting that Marconi had a hand in starting Vatican radio too. Well, you know, as 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 an Italian, he probably had uh, ins with the with the Pope back then. So, <laughs> okay. Well, well, thank you very much, Ed. That was a great presentation and and uh, certainly an interesting uh, visit you had out there to Cape Cod. That's there's a lot of cool stuff there, and uh, I didn't know any of that stuff about how that transmitter was constructed. That's that's great. Um, um, I will quickly just if you can see my screen there. This is a page from our latest uh, ARCI newsletter. There's a book review in there uh, that uh, the editor, Marine uh, wrote, and it's about uh, uh, Marconi is in a uh, part of the story. So uh, as you can see right there, uh, you can go check out our newsletter and uh, ties into Ed's presentation. I think we can now proceed with Mike White's part two presentation on his power supply that he built for his Swan 250 receiver. Can you take it away, Mike? Okay, good morning, everyone. I'm just gonna see if I can put this in its um, slideshow mode. Is that, uh, can everybody see that? Yes, it's both. Okay, great. Um, just, uh, a warning again, uh, the usual disclaimer, this project contains potentially lethal voltages. Anyone who chooses to use or adapt circuits of this type does so at their own risk, but you all know that. In our last episode, yours truly had impulsively bought a vintage Swan 250 six meter transceiver at a swap meet, not realizing it was missing a companion power supply speaker unit. Oops. I checked eBay and experienced acute sticker shock when I priced the missing piece there. Undaunted, I determined to build my own power supply from junk box parts. I found mo most of the parts I needed except for the power transformer. Arky's own Bill Cohn mentioned a homebrew power supply he had used successfully to power his Heathkit transceiver. He no longer needed it and generously gave it to me. Thanks again, Bill. I updated the power supply and adapted it to interface with the SWAN. Progress was made and I soon reached the point where I could start testing. No smoke, the lights light up, the standby relay works, all the voltage is present and their polarity is correct. So far, so good. But without loaded testing, I didn't want to plug the SWAN 250 into it for fear of releasing smoke and breaking some irreplaceable parts. What I needed now was a way to emulate the SWAN 250 loading the power supply without using the SWAN itself. That meant a dummy load, or more precisely, five resistive dummy loads. Now, since SWAN listed the nominal target voltages and currents in their manual for the 250, it was easy to calculate the target resistances and wattages I needed. Wow, 352 total watts. That would take a lot of power resistors getting very hot to dissipate all that power. Or I could try to design active loads. Well, <laughs> just what I need in other projects. This sent me rummaging through the power resistor box, calculating, head scratching, etc. I wanted to find a solution with which I could just soak the power supply for a while or simulate more normal intermittent operation. Hmm. Uh, some combination of these or, ah, Eureka, 
dawned on me. A relatively easy solution would be to use incandescent light bulbs as dummy load resistors. A few of their advantages. I had some and could easily get more. They're relatively inexpensive. Uh, I was finding them at garage and uh, state sales pretty commonly. Several bulbs in series can be used to load high voltage supplies. They can be chosen to dissipate the power. Their glow can provide a direct indication of go, no go, and roughly how much they're dissipating. They come with their own convenient mounting means in the Edison socket, which uh, turned out to be quite convenient. The fixture could easily be repurposed for other projects. I recalled a long time ago tuning up a 40 meter ham transmitter using a, a light bulb load. I was pretty sure they could work as DC loads, but how could I determine which bulb sizes to use? Well, incandescent light bulbs can be thought of as power resistors, but unlike most conventional power resistors, which are specified by their resistance value and wattage, uh, light bulbs are specified by their operating voltage and wattage. Well, that seemed like a good place to start. Just going by the nominal operating voltage of 120 volts, I estimated that I would need seven or eight bulbs in series for the plus 800 volt load, three or four bulbs in series for the plus 275 volt load, and a single bulb for the minus 110 volt load. What I needed to, but next I needed to determine which wattage bulbs to use. Now, the SWAN 250 voltage requirement for the high B plus supply is plus 800 volts at 300 milliamps. P equals EI tells me that the load needs to be able to dissipate at least 240 watts. Uh, okay. 240 watts divided equally by eight bulbs would produce 30 watts per bulb. The closest standard household bulb sizes are 25 watts and 40 watts. 25 watts is too low. Um, eight of those would be 200 watts. So I elected to go with the 40 watt bulbs, which uh, would give me 320 watts. For the plus 275 volts, uh, 41 watt su supply, four 25 watt bulbs in series look like a good choice, providing margins for both applied voltage per bulb and total power. For the minus 110 volt supply, a single 15 volt bulb is a good starting point. And here's the schematic. Uh, I group the bulbs for each supplies load uh, in the schematic here. Uh, each grouping includes a current sense resistor uh, at the ground return to measure current with a DVM. Uh, and I decided to use a screw terminal strip to connect to the power supply. For the filament supply and relay supply, down here, uh, 120, the 120 volt bulbs obviously don't work for low voltage. I have a fair number of automotive bulbs, interior and tail lights and indicator bulbs, pilot lights on hand. And these are easy to select just by the operating voltage and the current. At this point, I had enough information to proceed with the dummy load fixture. I quickly found a suitable piece of wood in the garage and scored 14 Edison sockets and some new old stock light bulbs at estate sales. I began assembling the load board, refining the design as I went. Okay, and here, here are pictures. I apologize for the background, but uh, uh, you can see here the uh, front view and the side view. Um, and the front view here, you can see the eight uh, bulbs, the 840 watt bulbs would have gone here for the uh, 800 volt supply, the four for the 275 volt supply, 25 watt bulbs, a single 15 watt bulb here, and uh, down at the bottom are automotive bulbs for the uh, the filament. Uh, here's a uh, uh, that screw terminal strip that I used to connect to it, and a side view that just shows it propped up on its little legs there. A uh, close-up of the, uh, uh, the screw terminal strip. Uh, you can see the current sense measurement resistors here. Uh, several of them. I put a bunch in parallel for the uh, filament supply because the current was so high. Uh, and the standby on switch. This is the uh, uh, stands in for the switch on the front of the uh, uh, transceiver, the on-off switch. 
Okay. Uh, and I wanted uh, I wanted to add a switch in line with the plus 800 volts to switch the load in or out, like uh, simulate key up, key down. But where to get an 800 volt switch? A few of the Edison sockets have full switches, but none of them are rated for 800 volts. So I closed all the switches, hid the chains under the sockets, and resorted to 19th century technology, a knife switch. The one I found in the junk box has over an inch gap between contacts when open. I just have to be very careful where I put my hand. I hooked a miniature neon bulb from my junk box in series with a 4.7 meg ohm resistor, carbon cop resistor, and attached this network across the uh, contacts of the 800 volt knife switch on the test board. In receive mode, the knife switch is open placing uh, plus 800 volts across the neon bulb and resistor, causing it to light up. In transmit mode, the switch is closed, uh, extinguishing the neon bulb, but lighting the 840 watt light bulbs. It's better to be safe than sorry. All this was going well, and I would soon try lighting it, uh, lighting it up. But in my mind, there were some nagging questions. How accurate are my light bulb loads, and is this a reasonable approach? Can I determine what the per bulb and total resistance will be for a given voltage? The more head scratching I did, the more I gave into my curiosity and ended up turning a relatively simple project into a major investigation. Uh-oh. When I started digging into the problem, I realized how little I knew about incandescent light bulbs, so I went about educating myself. I learned a lot and compiled some interesting data which I can make available to the club. However, this did not, did not ultimately affect the design of the load board, which was intended for non-precision testing, so I'm not including it here. With the light board dummy load, I was able to operate the power supply at full continuous transmit for over an hour with no smoke or hot spots. The transformers were a bit warm, but probably no warmer than if they were in a TV set. I also exercised the transmit knife switch to operate, uh, to simulate a QSO on AM and notice no problems. Uh, there was quite a spark from the knife switch though on uh, break, I think. In any unregulated power supply, the voltage rails will droop a bit when going from no load to full load. The two B plus supplies showed significant voltage droop when connected to the dummy load board. You can see that here. Um, the, still, the voltages were close enough for the most part. When the uh, transmit knife switch was closed, uh, it increased the uh, loading by 172 watts. The plus two, 275 volt supply fell by 50 volts. Uh, and the filament supply dropped by one volt. The plus 800 is about 170 volts low at full load, so it won't produce full rated output power in the swan. Yeah, that's okay. The loaded, loaded minus 110 volt supply is low at minus 100, uh, which drops to minus 92 in transmit. And you'll notice the current is uh, always higher than the, uh, uh, the target. Uh, that, uh, this, you know, it's still adequate to bias the minus 10 volt Zener diode in the Swan 250, but it's below spec. It appears the 15 watt bulb was too low in resistance, making for a slight overload. Okay. The overall verdict. From the results, I could confidently say the Swan tran 250 transceiver was not going to burn up if I ran it off the do-it-yourself power supply. Pass is the primary criteria, good enough. And here's the only picture I took of the load board in operation. I'm not a really good photographer, and there were issues with lighting a light source, so I told myself at the time I'd get back to it later and see how that turned out. Uh, some observations. Uh, using incandescent light bulbs for dummy loads works and has some advantages, but there are disadvantages as well. The process of choosing bulbs is not necessarily as straightforward as for fixed resistors. Domestic household bulbs are designed for 120 volt operation, plus or minus a few volts, and technically I'm using them outside of their design envelope. For over voltage conditions, they will not be nearly as forgiving as fixed resistors, and their under voltage characteristics are not specified or controlled. 
If I needed to load the power supply, supply precisely to measure some parameters like line regulation, transient response, etc., I would be better off using fixed power resistors or an active load since the positive temperature coefficient of the light bulbs would add uncertainty to such measurements. With a power supply of this type, the ultimate platform for load testing is the desired load itself, in this case, the SWAN 250 transceiver. Neither incandescent light bulbs nor fixed power resistors are perfect models of the actual load. In conclusion, incandescent light bulbs as, DC, as loads for DC power supplies can be useful where precision is not required. The bulbs function well, but trying to measure to match their resistance to the voltage and current requirements of the supply under test is a bit tricky. Since I finished testing with the dummy load, I did power up the SWAN 250 using this power supply. It did not burn up and works so far as receiving, transmitting CW into a cantenna, tuning, VFO, etc. Ironically, the SWAN itself is not 100% healthy. And for now, I set it aside to work on other projects. And uh, maybe part three someday? And, hmm, I don't know. <laughs> maybe not. And that's my presentation. Well, thanks, Mike. That's, uh, that was a pretty amazing uh, journey that you went through there and you didn't kill yourself or uh, <laughs> let the smoke out. You know, that's some pretty dangerous uh, potential there on those uh, those wires that are just sitting out there in the open. So uh, congratulations on still being alive. Thanks, thank you very much. Uh, Would you say the most expensive thing in there was your uh, sockets for their bulbs? No, because um, I got them for like, um, I don't know, they, they were, there was a box of them at a, an estate sale. Somebody had been trying to do some, uh, uh, had plans for some you know, update in their house and they never got around to it. And, you know, there's this box with like new sockets and I says, oh, okay, I could use these. That worked out but good. It did, it, a lot of things did, it was amazing. Question. Yeah. Besi besides getting sunburned from all the light, <laughs> um, where did you pick up that swan? Was that at an archie meet at the Shriners? I'm sorry, pick up the what? The Swan, the 250. Oh no, that well, that was at a uh, a ham fest uh, south of Milwaukee, um, and uh, it was uh, it was funny because it was near the end, and there were some rain clouds coming in from the west, and everybody was looking very uh, nervously at the clouds, and I, you know, we were headed by this table on the way to get under some shelter, and there's this radio there, and oh, well, that looks like my other one, and. He only wanted 35 bucks. So I thought, oh, great. <laughs> but uh, I, I wasn't that familiar with the, uh, the Swan radios with that model. I didn't realize it didn't come with the power supply because my uh, uh, 270B has the power supply internal. So. Okay. Also, the, uh, the front, on the front of the knobs, I noticed a couple of chrome pieces missing. Yeah, well, yeah. It, it, but, uh, it, but. Yeah, but if you look up K3ICH, he makes those uh, those inserts for those knobs. K3ICH. Oh, okay. And they look they look fabulous. And I end up he makes them for the uh, for the Swans, the Drakes, the Collins, uh, all the different uh, with the uh, spiral look to it. So they look, they're like original. Anyway, I just thought I'd mention it. No, I appreciate it, Keith. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Okay, any other questions for Mike? I think um, we're ready to move on. Matt, are you gonna show that poll right now? There we go. This is a poll to see if you're interested in giving a presentation. Uh, this is a great opportunity to share your knowledge and your passion about your hobby with the rest of us. So, you know, give us an indication and you've got months to figure it out. We've got presentations lined up. I think for March, maybe we could use one more, but 
the meetings after that, we could use some presenters. So, so please uh, tell us uh, your ideas and, and get uh, get going, and we'll we'll get you on the air here. Um, our final presentation today is uh, by Tom Kleinschmidt. It's part three of his radio preservation series, and uh, after that, uh, we will go into the show and tell section. Looks like Tom's ready to go. So Tom, take it away. And I see some new faces on the, uh, on the call today. So you'll have to kind of bear with it. This is, this is part three. And it, the point was to try and uh, take a standard plastic radio you'd find any radio meat and uh, clean it up and make it look good. And uh, so get started there. So first off my standard disclaimer, you know, what I'm doing isn't the only way to do it. Uh, there, there's probably better ways, there's other ways, uh, and I'm trying to make it so anyone who hasn't done it before uh, gets an idea of what to do. So uh, the rest of it's all detail. So here's our candidate, this fodder radio from 1947, and it was pretty dirty. Um, and uh, this radio, by the way, came, I believe, in brown as well as this ivory color. In fact, it actually says that over here if I just read my own notes. So um, here's where we are. We're going to go through an inspection of now that it's all clean, take a look at the cabinet, uh, repair some things, do a final polish and what I'm calling sealing, which is really just to, you know, keep the dirt off, so to speak. So uh, here we go. Cracks, chips, and factory defects. All these arrows show you a crack. And, and my hypothesis as a non-materials engineer here is that these are mostly stress cracks because they're all around holes, except for the one in the lower left. So in the ones up here where I got my, my mouse moving around are hard to see. There's actually a, a radial one in two directions on both of these holes where the handle mounts. This is on the front of the cabinet. There's, there's one by each knob, just for no particular good reason, but there they are. And you can see the handle's got a hairline in it as well. And this crack on the lower left is probably because the thing got dropped or got mishandled. So this is actually the only crack that I would say was probably user caused uh, in this lower left. And of course, the bad news, as I mentioned last time, is once you get one of these cracks, dirt gets in the cracks, and I don't have a good way to get the dirt out. If it had been a brown radio, you'd never see the dirt. So um, then the question to the audience here, kind of uh, academically, is, is this a crack? Is this a chip, this big chunk out here? Because you notice this, this, this border should be all the way around here but yet it's broken out here. And the answer is no, it's not. This was what we call an engineering, an opportunity for redesign. This pilot light right there sticks up and it wouldn't shine down on the dial if you had the plastic all the way down to here. And so my guess is they handed somebody on the production line a pair of pliers and said, break this out. And of course the extra added bonus is you get another crack. This one's actually got a fork in the road. Um, so it's not a chip in the true sense of the word. And the good news is it's on the top. So you really don't notice it unless it's on a top shelf. If it's on a normal height table, you probably never notice it. So uh, then there's a, some molding, de the molding defect here on the right-hand side. You see this little blob right here. For whatever reason, when it came out of the mold, it didn't come out nice and straight. It came out with this little chunk of extra plastic. So just things to look at. So my point of view in the short is I'm leaving it all alone. Uh, it may make sense to do something with that large crack on the side, but that, it won't get any worse if you don't push on it. Uh, and I don't know if anybody's got any experience with uh, various glues on the backside or whether they put fiberglass on the backside or what they do to kind of keep that from getting worse, but I wasn't going to experiment since I don't have any experience with that. So that's the inspection piece. So as I mentioned, I'm just gonna carry on and make it look nice. So uh, uh, first thing was, if you remember the grill cloth we took out in the first session of this, it's not really normal radio grill cloth because in a normal radio, you wouldn't do anything to touch the grill cloth to try and clean it because it'll just get all messed up. It'll either unweave or it'll, it'll disintegrate or something bad will happen. But in this case, it was really dirty. And uh, in fact, you can see 
here is the pattern of the plastic that's in front of it. There's that little round circle. Once you see the radio again, you'll notice it. And then there's this bar that goes like this. And of course, all this border is behind the opening. So we had this woolite fabric cleaner laying around. Now, I don't know if this thing is, is a year old or 20 years old, so it may not be you know, what you currently can buy. But uh, I just used a sponge and gently slid it from the center to the outside and then let it dry. And I also blotted it, which I don't show in here, with a piece of paper towel, which also pulled out. But I, I was rinsing the sponge constantly. There, I had a little uh, container of water. I was constantly squeezing the sponge out and uh, took quite a bit of the dirt off. So here's the before, here's the after. So it ain't perfect, but I think it looks a whole lot better. Um, it also, you can tell that, you know, there's still a little moisture in here because the, the weave is a little tighter on this side. I'm sure with a little bit of time, that'll dry out again a little more. Not that it's wet in this picture, but I went through that cleaning cycle three times just because I was on a roll. And like I said, it's important to go from the center out because you don't want to push this way you'll start pushing all of these open-ended pieces in places you don't want to push them. So that was one part of the cabinet that had to be cleaned up. Uh, the second thing was the back of that is a cardboard kind of back. And it was it's a, it's this break actually goes all along where I'm showing you my mouse. It's hard to see in the picture. So structurally, it was getting a little funky. So I just took a piece of brown paper, the stuff like you get when you buy a box from Amazon and they have paper wadded in there and some contact cement. And uh, you'll see on the final assembly, I had to do that in multiple locations. Uh, if it wasn't for the cutouts in here, I probably would have just covered the whole back with paper, but I really didn't want to get into arts and crafts that heavily. So next thing was to clean the dial uh, window. Now, this McGuire's product I've got here, I've had for years. Whether they make the same stuff or not, I can't tell you. But there's a lot of these two-step plastic cleaners that are out in the automotive, automotive world. You go to your local auto parts store, you'll find something that will do what, what this does. And the difference here really is, is the grit, I'll call it. You know, the cleaner is more aggressive than the polish. And this thing had some nasty scratches that you really can't see. Actually, this is the after picture, so... But I couldn't get a good shot of the scratches. You know, it's one of those things you can see it when it's in your hand, but you can't see it in a photograph. So I, I did the, the, the cleaner and the polish and, uh, and uh, I used one of these blue towels for application, but I used, uh, I'm really big on microfiber cloths. That's what I used to polish it off. So I did the same thing on the cabin. I used the McGuire's product first and got some gloss back because you might recall I use never dull on here to get all the nasty things off and never dull is a is a much coarser grit if you want to use the word again than this plastic cleaner and the plastic polish so basically it's like almost like you're sanding wood where I'm going from like 80 grit to 120 grit to 400 grit kind of a thing and, and not that that matches that's the notion and as you recall when I was showing you the grill cloth here's the bar and the circle that was really uh, apparent with the dirt in these open areas before we cleaned it. And then I went and used one of my favorites on all kinds of radios is some Johnson Pace Wax. And that was just to try and keep the thing from accumulating dirt as easily. Uh, it makes it easier to wipe the cabinet off with a, with a dust rag or something. And so that, what I'm calling the sealing process, which is really a misnomer, but uh, it's different than polishing. So that's why I wanted to make a distinction. So carrying on, uh, I put the handle on and again, use some wax on the screws so the wax, the screws wouldn't seize up in the handle. Uh, we've all been in situations where something metallic against something not metallic has corroded a little bit and, and expanded and suddenly getting it out, it becomes a real problem. So I'm trying to make it so the guy 30 years from now is going to work on this radio can get it apart. Uh, so everything I'm doing is made to be reversible with the exception of the, you know, gluing the paper on the back of the cardboard. So the other thing that's important is just make this thing snug. Don't crank on these things. That's probably why that thing is cracked in the first place. It was a little bit too tight. And with temperature changes in the room, that handle had to give. And maybe the adjacent holes too, which is why they're cracked. We can only speculate, but we saw, we see the results of, you know, something that's uh, 70 years old here that's got a bunch of cracks in it. So then the next step was to put the uh, window in. And I used hot milk glue. And I just put a little dabble, do you, three along the side here, 
two along the bottom, right on that trailing edge of the window. I can't put anything up here because it's all broken out. And uh, so, uh, of course, these windows shrink and warp and often are cracked. And fortunately, this one isn't, but they are yellowed from age. And uh, you know, if you had a brand new one, it would be crystal clear. This is yellow, of course. And uh, and the, the important thing is that this little cutout right here has to be at the top because that's where the pilot light goes. And uh, so that was step one of reassembling the cabinet. Step two was to put the grill cloth back in. It's got these little push pins. And you can see there's a couple other places where I had to make some repairs. And uh, so here's where we started. As you recall, getting this greeny looking stuff off was really a project. And here's where we are. And of course, you can see the couple of cracks here, there and there. And of course, they're still there, there and there. Um, and uh, that's how it looks all put back together. So I um, didn't have as much light on the front as I thought I did. But we'll carry on with this because next time I'm going to start working on uh, re re uh, restoring the chassis. So we'll have other chances to look at this radio. And that's what I got. So Tom, um, when you put the uh, handle back on, were those uh, uh, metal washers? Yeah, that was actually on there originally. I want to use like a rubber gaskets instead. So a little more cushion. You could. Okay. Just a thought. Yeah, yeah. Hey, Tom, I've had really good luck getting stains out of carpets with OxyClean. And I wonder if although the woolite might have, be the same chemical makeup, but OxyClean is a really interesting product. You, you dab it on much like you did with the uh, woolite. Yeah, I didn't. I, I, uh, I actually, I have experience on a piece of furniture that I used uh, some OxyClean on and it stained the fabric. I've never had it happen on anything but that. And so I used the Woolite because I thought it would be a little less aggressive. I, I was going to live with a little bit more dirt versus a disintegrated uh, 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 piece of fabric. But uh, I think it's worth trying on something where it doesn't show to see what happens. Okay, any other questions for Tom? Yeah, Tom, Dale Boyce here. Uh, there is a product that uh, uh, called Never Sees that you might try on the uh, on the screws when you put them back in so that you can well, get them out again. Never Sees is a metal-to-metal -metal thing. I use it when I'm on my antique cars, but I didn't want to stain the plastic because that's a, a petroleum-based and usually has either aluminum or copper in it if you're talking about the same product I think you're talking about. And so I use wax or soap because it's inert when it comes to the plastic. And uh, that was the logic. Yeah, basically, I made my own version of anti-seize by using the wax. But the, the uh, you know, the head bolts on my Model T have, you know, the conventional anti-seize on it. But I don't have to worry about staining that. Thanks, Dale. Okay, Tom, thank you very much for part three of your series. We, we look forward to the continuing uh, parts of that uh, series and uh, it's been some really good information there. So thanks very much. That concludes our presentation section. And now we will be moving to the show and tell time, which I'll just welcome anyone who has anything right now off the cuff you want to talk about. Here's your opportunity to uh, join in and spend anywhere from one to three minutes talking about it. And I, from our poll questions, we, it looks like we have one person that's definitely interested, but we, we do have a little more time than normal uh, today. So I think we could accommodate more show and tells if you guys want to. So. With that being said, let's go and start the this, this show and tell section. And whoever uh, would like to start, please go ahead. Okay, go. Okay, well, I have to share the screen, so we'll see how this goes. <laughs> okay, Jeff. Thanks, guys. Uh, let's see. I don't know if this is working. Can you guys see my screen? Yes, we can. There we go. 
So I think, I think like the rest of you guys, uh, I don't know, this is kind of looking funny on my screen, but anyway, um, you know, you've, you've been rebuilding radios for a long time and, and you love when you come across something unique that you haven't seen before. Um, for me, uh, and I love consoles and, and, and my, fortunately my wife is very patient with me. I probably have 10 of them in my main floor and, uh, and I, I just can't seem to stop taking them in and I rebuild them. I rebuild the electronics and I refinish them as well. I like doing both. So it's, it's a fun, especially wintertime hobby, but I got this radio the other day. Well, the other day, a couple of years ago now, the other day, so relative. Um, and this, this gentleman had this radio. I was working on something else with him. He was a music box guy who fixed music boxes and stuff. And he didn't, he didn't want the radio. He, he said, do you, do you want this radio? And I'm like, of, of course. <laughs> So I bring the radio home and this is in its finished state, of course, it, it, it looked terrible when I got it. Um, and it's a, it's a 1930 RCA Victor R35. I don't know if any of you guys ever worked on one of these. It's called a microsynchronous and it's like a, it's like a hybrid between, well, it's a TRF, but it's, it's, it's been somewhat automated. Um, you don't have to, um, you don't have to, to, to mess with each individual um, RF stage and adjust it. So it's, it's, it's not a super head. So it's somewhere in between. It's, it's kind of in between. Um, this radio, um, I did, I did, I was able to get a, uh, a, a repro reproduction uh, face on there. That's not the original. The original was really obliterated. And as you guys know, if you even touch that, even with sometimes even with just water, <laughs> the, the stuff comes off. So I was able to get that, and, and I, I could, if not, if you guys don't know where to get those, I can look up where the heck I got it. I can't remember. Yeah, there's the face there. Uh, the other cool thing about this radio, and you, you guys know this too a lot, is that, that this, I thought this stuff was wood, this, this beautiful molding stuff, and the guy told me, yeah, it's like shellac. It's like made of a, a, a composite material that, that's really brittle. Um, you have to be really careful with it, and I was, fortunately. Um, so this is the back of the radio and this is after, uh, you know, I, I opened it up and, uh, I, I, I rattle canned it with some, some silver paint and some brown paint on the bottom. Uh, of course, masking everything off. And there's the original label for the mites and micro synchronous radio. Um, so, and it's, it's so heavy. It's a two, it's a two man job lifting this thing. And uh, you, you can't lift this yourself. I, you don't even try. In fact, if somebody had tried earlier in the top it popped off. So we had to we had to put that back on again. <laughs> uh, so inside this thing is you have a gang of, of of variable capacitors, right? That are that are running each stage, that are going through each stage in the radio. And there's a lever on the top here that when you turn this lever back and forth here, you can see it on the screen. You push that back and forth. That's how you tune the radio. And what's happening is this is the underside. There's cans over each one of these. Uh, there's, there's, I think, five, I guess, um, variable capacitors in here, and I cover those. And let's see, and then I'll get to that later. So if you look at this, can you, can you guys see that moving? Yes. This is, this is how the inside of this thing works. I, 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 now, this I stole from somebody on the internet, so I, put the, I, I gave credit where it's due there. But I, I did take the cans out of mine. And I did observe it myself. And I, I was the, this is the coolest thing ever. <laughs> I love this. Um, so the, the reason I show this, I, mean, I only got three minutes. I'll try my best here. To, to, I'm almost done. But, you know, one of the things, and you guys run into this too, is, is when you get these, these RF coils and they get corroded and the wire breaks in them and you're like, what am I going to do now? You know, you get one of these ones with extremely fine wire. I've got the ones with the more coarse wire. And, and of course, I, I just wind them myself. I have fun winding coils. But, you know, something like this, uh, you know. So what happened was I was able to steal um, a, similar, um, a similar inductor from an old Zenith um, I had. And it, uh, and it worked. So I was lucky. I had one of these go out like this. And the other ones, fortunately, they were all okay. So I only had to do one of them. Um, and, the, and the reason I show this schematic is this is the schematic of the radio is, as you guys know, in these really old radios, you got these, these, these non-polarized huge can capacitors that, that weigh 20 pounds each. 
and that you generally don't mess with them unless they're leaking, right? So in this particular radio, they have the potting compound started to leak out a little bit. So I'm like, okay, these are warming up. These are gonna, these are gonna die one of these days. They're gonna short or at least act more like resistors and capacitors. So I, um, I replaced these with non-polarized um, capacitors. I was able to get, and the values of these are all pretty low. They're one, two microfarad. So you only needed to get a couple of, uh, I used one microfarad non-polarized capacitors to replace these. So I took the cans out, I, 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 deep, I depotted them. I got all the insides out of them. And then, uh, so you know, lightens up the radio a little bit anyway. And then, uh, and then use these capacitors and made sure the voltages were all right, uh, that they weren't increased above what they were supposed to be. Um, and yeah, so that was easier. And those are the kinds of capacitors I used to replace those um, in this radio in yeah, 1930. So that's, uh, so that's all I had. I just thought that was an interesting radio and uh, you guys might find it interesting. Yeah, that's great, Jeff. That was fascinating. That, that mechanism is, is something I've never come across. That's pretty, pretty amazing. Yeah. I don't know if anybody else has seen that. And uh, I, must, I must say that that was such an excellent show and tell that we're ready to move you up to the presentation section next time. <laughs> so. okay. I'll make a sum. Well, the one thing I could present, and actually I had a presentation for the, with the, the, uh, the McHenry County Wireless Association was I had one on, I build Tesla coils too. I have one on Tesla coils. I could give one on that, but it's yeah. not, it's not, I it, think it kind of was radio. I mean, it's an early attempt at a transmitter, right? I guess. Yeah. So I know um, that it's cool. Just keep that in mind for the next time you want to present. We're going to just do a full blown 10, 15 minute presentation. That was excellent. Thank you very okay. much. Thanks. Okay. Is there any other show and tell topic that people would like to uh, bring to the front here right now? For you antique uh, TV fans out there, this is a freebie that popped up on Craigslist. And I, you know how me, how I like freebies. Let me see if I share the screen. It's a 19, <laughs> and, uh, that appears to be, and it is a 1949 or 1950 Philco TV. Now it looks to be all complete. I'm needing the knobs for this. Um, haven't tested it out, nothing like that. It looks to be all complete, not marred yet, but we'll see how it goes. Uh, it's a small. Uh, TV set. This uh, it's a seven-inch screen. Uh, like I say, I haven't very acted or done any testing to the thing yet. Um, so allegedly, there's a uh, another antique TV uh, fan that's out there's going to supply me with the knobs. But if anything, I'll make a nice little decoration, which I polish up the cabinet, I'll go alongside my uh, my 55-inch HD TV screen, like the before and after. But that's my share of the day. Uh, realize is that, it. Is that an electrostatic set or has that got uh, the uh, deflection yoke? Electrostatic? I, I'm sorry. You mean the... is the picture tube an electrostatic picture tube or has it got a is it got magnetic deflection with a deflection yoke? Uh, not sure. Okay. Because a lot of those early sets were electrostatic, basically an oscilloscope format uh, deflection. Yeah, it kind of looks like something off an old oscilloscope. It's a round tube. Yeah, well, it's real deep too, and that's the other. Yes. that's the other clue because you know oscilloscope tubes are deep because the deflection plates are inside the glass. Ah. And, uh, okay. So, yeah. So yeah, just curious. Yeah, and uh, we're prepared to mess with this a bit when the time comes. It's uh, still in my vehicle, and I'm waiting for it to thaw out outside there, so I don't slip and fall and break the tv um I, I likely have the sams for that if you need it uh okay i'll hit you up if if need be and we'll we'll see how it rolls so thank you for allowing me to late uh show and tell well it's uh, eleven twenty-five, matt so if uh, that concludes the show and tell section then matt will terminate the recording about now <laughs>